Maybe you've heard it before. People saying things like, MO theory is much better than valence bond theory, or maybe something like, valence bond theory fails for even simple molecules like oxygen. Let's take a look at the difference between MO theory and valence bond theory. Here we'll compare MO theory and hybridization theory for a simple molecule, ammonia, so that you can see, maybe for the first time, exactly what the two theories are doing. If you really feel one is better than the other, that feeling may quickly dissipate once you realize how related they are. Instead of referring to valence bond theory specifically, I'll use the term hybridization theory, which kind of encompasses valence bond theory and natural bond orbital theory, which are in some ways related. We will use MO and hybridization theory as applied to ammonia on an equal footing. We can start with the orbitals for nitrogen, which will be on one side of our diagram for both methods. Here, we will put it in the middle and do MO theory to one side and hybridization theory on the other. The starting point for any MO analysis is the geometry of the molecule, and ammonia has a trigonal pyramidal structure with H and H angles of about 107 degrees. Consequently, the compound is in the C3V point group. Nitrogen has four valence orbitals, an S, PX, PY, and PZ. For MO theory, it is critical to have the irreducible representations for these orbitals, which are A1 for S and PZ and E for PX and PY. There's an energy gap between the S and P orbitals, which we will just call ESP. One can get a good estimate of the energy gap for the atom by several experimental or computational methods, but the exact values aren't terribly important for the job at hand. We've done the MOs for ammonia on this channel before, and I'll just use the results here. We will link that video, which is the third in the series on MO theory, in the show notes below. What we found was that the symmetry adapted linear combinations of atomic orbitals for the hydrogen and ammonia have A1 and E symmetry with the shapes and phases shown. If you look at the MO diagram, there is a three orbital interaction with A1. There are two A1 orbitals on nitrogen and one A1 on the hydrogen salx. If you don't have any other information, the recommendation is to create a bonding, non-bonding, and antibonding set of orbitals, which is what we've done in our diagram. The S orbital on nitrogen definitely looks like it will overlap better with the A1 salc than the PZ orbital, which looks like it might even have a little bit of antibonding character. So let's say the PZ orbital is non-bonding and S makes a bonding antibonding combination like this, where the circle to A1 orbital is non-bonding. Now, this orbital could mix with either bonding 1A1 to go lower in energy or with 3A1 star to be raised in energy, but we have no data to suggest which, so we'll leave it here for now. We fill in our electrons as arrows into the orbitals, and you can clearly see that the three pairs of electrons go into bonding orbitals 1A1 and 1E. So there are three delocalized bonds in the MO and one lone pair, 2A1. In other words, the MO diagram roughly fits with what you'd expect from the Lewis diagram with one net covalent bond to each hydrogen and one lone pair. Now let's do the hybridization theory analysis. For this, we will need two equations which we introduced in the previous video in the series, but the equations are pretty easy to understand. These equations use the hybridization parameter, which is given the symbol lambda. In hybrids, we write sp lambda. For example, for sp2, lambda equals two. First, we have the Coulson directionality theorem. If the hybrids are orthogonal, this equation has to be satisfied. Here is the general form of the equation where omega ij is the angle between the hybrids, and lambda i and lambda j are the hybridization parameters for the two different hybrids. If the two hybrids happen to be the same, then it simplifies to this useful equation. The other equation we'll need is the sum rule. If we take all the hybrids on an atom and sum of all the s contributions to each hybrid, there must be one total valence s orbital in there somewhere. So for all the ith hybrids in an atom, there's one s, which can be written mathematically like this. Just like for MO theory, the starting point for any hybridization analysis is the geometry of the molecule. And recall that the compound is pyramidal with H and H angles of 107 degrees. In C through V symmetry, each of the NH bonds is equivalent. As a result, the nitrogen should use three equivalent hybrids to bond to the hydrogens. We can use the Coulson directionality theorem with equivalent hybrids to find the nature of those hybrids. This involves plugging in 107 degrees for omega and calculating the value for lambda. Find cosine 107 degrees. Both sides are negative, so we can multiply by negative 1 on both sides to make them both positive. 
then multiply both sides by lambda and divide both sides by 0.29, and lambda equals 3.4. So the hybrids on nitrogen used to bond to the hydrogens are sp3.4 hybrids, three of them. The only thing we don't know for a hybridization picture is what hybrid is used to hold the lone pair. We can find this using the sum rule. We have three identical hybrids used to bond to the hydrogens, which are sp3.4, and we have the hybrid that is used to hold the lone pair on nitrogen, which we don't know yet. The equation looks like this. Let's evaluate the first term after the equal sign, which gives approximately 0.682. Then we can subtract 0.682 from each side. We need to get lambda LP by itself. Let's multiply both sides by 1 plus lambda LP, then divide both sides by 0.318. Finally, we can subtract one from both sides and evaluate the right, which gives 2.1. So the lone pair on nitrogen is residing in an sp2.1 hybrid. Now we can draw a hybridization diagram, much like we did for MO theory. What we've done is generate nitrogen sp hybrids that point directly at the hydrogens, then take in what is left for the lone pair. We can even calculate the energies of these hybrids relative to the sp energy gap. The equation for that is here, where E hybrid is the energy of the hybrid orbital and delta ESP is the S to P orbital energy gap. Basically, if you have a pure S orbital, which is SP0, then it will be 0. And if you have a pure P orbital, which is SP infinity, then you get 1 for the first term. Other hybrids are in between. Our hybrids used to form the bonds are sp3.4, so their energy is 0.77 delta ESP. So the sp3.4 hybrid is about 77% of the way up from s to p. For the lone pair, we can use the same equation and find the energy is 0.68 delta ESP, so about 68% of the way from s to p. Our hybrid picture looks something like this. Note that these sp3.4 hybrids are directly pointed at the hydrogen, so we don't need to do anything else. We just overlap them and form bonding and antibonding orbitals to get our completed diagram. Let's put the MO and hybridization theory results together and see the difference. There are two glaring differences. First, hybridization theory told us directly what the energy of the lone pair was from a very simple calculation. We can use that to correct our MO diagram. The 2a1 orbital must mix some with 1a1 to come down in energy somewhat. Second, the NH bonds on the hybridization side are really seen as equivalent, consistent with our intuition. The NH bonds on the MO side are also equivalent, but it is less apparent because there are two different MOs of a1 and e symmetry that are delocalized leading to the bonds. So which picture for ammonia is better? In reality, how could one be better? In MO theory, we left the nitrogen atomic orbitals alone, then we mixed the hydrogen orbitals, i.e. made salks, so that they are proper symmetry to mix with the nitrogen atomic orbitals. In hybridization theory, we left the hydrogen orbitals alone and mixed the nitrogen atomic orbitals so that they are proper position to overlap with the hydrogens. The two methods are only different in which side of the orbitals that we chose to mix so that they overlap with the other side. If MO theory or hybridization theory is better, it is because it is easier to implement or more informative for the question you're trying to ask. For ammonia, I would argue that hybridization theory is better because it's easier to implement, the equations are simpler. In addition, hybridization theory readily gives us the relative energy of the orbital holding the lone pair, a piece of information not as easily obtained from the MO picture. There are cases where MO theory is easier, like the electronic structure of O2, which we will discuss in a future video. So this showdown ends with a draw, or Maybe even looks like kind of that Spider-Man meme, because MO and hybridization theory really give you basically the same information. Thanks for watching. We make these videos for fun and as a way of giving back to the community. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe and give us a thumbs up. Really, the best way to support our channel is to watch more videos, and we have quite a few up at a variety of levels. We generate videos as best we can since we have other jobs, so please turn on the notifications button so you don't miss anything. Thanks again.